Hey everybody, Mark Ahrensberg here with The Pure Now Show. This is episode number 17. My guest today is Joshua Roberts. Joshua, a former magician, now brand strategist, is living full-time in Taiwan. Joshua left the States to follow his dreams of travel and being a creative professional. Here we go. Hey, Josh. Hey, Mark. Thanks so much for being on the Pure Now Show, man. Really appreciate you coming on and spending some time. And uh, we're super excited to talk to you about what you got going on. Yeah, thanks for having me. You're uh, a fellow statesman. You're from the Seattle area originally? Yeah, exactly. You look like a Seattle guy. I you got the too. hat, you got the beard. It's kind of Seattle slash Portland thing going on. I've got my uh, The Burke Museum of Natural History uh, cup here from Seattle. Well, speaking of, I just read that uh, recently maybe you just bought a new cappuccino machine. I know you can't start your day without a good cup of coffee. Yeah, I bought a, I bought a nice espresso machine because I love espresso and I wanted to try doing it at home. And how's that going? Uh, I've wasted a lot of beans. <laughs> So I realized just how important a coffee grinder is for the espresso making process. And uh, I, don't, I didn't really fully understand what I got myself into, how slippery of a slope it is. But um, I'm, uh, I'm dialing it in now. It's, it's getting better and better. And uh, as the latte art improves, I think I'll be posting some of that. I've been making some for my wife. She gives me credit no matter what I do. But. That's love. When you have support unconditionally, then you know you're with the right person. So I understand that you also, speaking of coffee grinder, that you did a crowdfunding to get the coffee grinder? No, no. I bought a machine that was originally on Indiegogo. So it was originally uh -huh. a crowdfunded grinder out of the UK called Niche. And it's a really cool grinder and uh, works super well. First of all, you're in Taiwan, correct? Yes, in Taipei. Correct. Taipei. Yeah. Let's talk about how that happened. Being from the States, you know, there's a lot of expats that come out to Asia to find themselves, find new opportunities. What was it that inspired you to leave the States and, and come out to Asia? I think it was just a time in my life. Uh, it was um, around 2002. I started to travel a bit. I traveled around for about a year. I ended up coming here and really loved it. Um, it was at basically the end of a year's worth of traveling and um, it was a really different spot than all of the, the previous locations throughout Asia that I was in. You know, I spent a couple months in China, a couple months in India, a couple months traveling throughout Southeast Asia, a month in Australia. And just after the end of all the traveling, once I got to Taiwan, it was actually during SARS, you know, I just kind of felt like it was the one location that I landed where I didn't feel like a tourist. People were really warm and friendly. Not to say that people weren't warm and friendly in other locations, but it was just a different feeling. I didn't feel like a tourist and nobody tried to sell me things or take me places. You know, this is pre-smartphone era uh, 2003 and um, it was just a different time you know I came here on a five-day layover and I ended up just staying so I mean, a lot of kind of interesting things happened in this short amount of time five days and I knew that the island just had more mystery and, and things that I was interested in and I ended up staying tell me about something that had happened within those five days that kind of got its clutches in sure. you and <laughs> and inspired you to not move on after the first day I, I actually had a really intense fever and I didn't even really think about it too much at that time. I may, I may have caught SARS, it was sort of like an intense 24 hour kind of bug. I was really feeling really crummy and um, after I got over it, I was staying um, in this apartment complex in Xinzhu, which is uh, an area south of Taiwan, uh, south of Taipei. It's kind of the, the Silicon Valley of Taipei. And, I was staying on the third floor and the, the landlord was on the second floor. I found this place because of a Taiwanese guy I knew back in Seattle helped hook me up with that apartment. And in the back lot of the apartment that I was staying was an abandoned old building and the jungle has sort of like reclaimed it, overgrown with, with trees and, and, and vines. and. It was surrounded by these tin roofs everywhere. And there were like hundreds of feral cats running around on the roofs and in this empty lot. And they were making a crazy amount of noise. You know, you imagine these cats in the springtime, you know, that are in heat and there's fighting and just, it was insane. Just the, all of this noise that was coming. So I, I was not really sleeping and I went downstairs and I knocked on the door 
And I couldn't really speak Chinese, and the guy couldn't really speak English, but I tried to, you know, say something about the cats. I didn't know what, what I was really expecting from this guy to do, you know, but, you know, I was trying to say, like, the, the cats, the, you know, trying to mime it out, and, and the guy told me, like, ah, okay, 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 okay. He just gave me the okay sign, and I, I, I didn't know what to expect. I returned to the apartment, I laid down, and 30 minutes later, there was a knock on the door. I went to the door, opened it. The guy had his huge cardboard box with a cigarette burning out of his mouth with like this much ash on the end of it. And he just walked in and I, I was like, okay. And he walked to the bedroom. He opened up the window and he put this box on the edge of the windowsill. And I was looking at him like, what is gonna be going on here? Like, I don't know what he's doing right now. And he reached into the box and he pulled out this wick and he lit it on his cigarette and it started to burn. And I'm thinking like, what is happening right now and then he quickly opened up the screen and he chucked this whole box out the window and it exploded with fireworks like everywhere like fourth of july these cats were running everywhere i mean they it was like mass exodus from this site and i'm sitting there like holy shit i can't believe this is happening my, my jaw was like wide open and then after this was done he turned to me and he goes Okay, <laughs> and I just, I, I just felt this, this, this kind of feeling like, who solves problems like this? <laughs> I never, I wouldn't have even considered this as an option for how to solve this problem. And after that, I, I, I just kind of had, had this feeling like, this place is interesting. <laughs> and there were several other examples of things like this in, in the first five days, and I knew at the end it was just too much. I, I just really couldn't leave. That's a great story. Scare the cats away. That was genius, actually. I mean, I don't like using the word genius too lightly, but that was pretty genius, I have to say. All right, so let's go back. You're in Seattle. You're growing up there. What was like that first spark? What influenced you or got you on this path, this creative path, and got you thinking about what you want to do with your future? Uh, so when I was in Seattle, I was a theater major in university. I never did anything with my, my degree. I studied sound and lighting design. And the reason why I chose to go into theater is because I was actually working as a professional magician. And that working as a magician actually was the catalyst to me doing a lot of things. It's what got me into web design because I needed to make a site for uh, our magic act. And that got me into building sites for other people. And that got me really interested in making money doing web design. So I, I, I think that, you know, being involved in doing magic was something that pushed me to learn more about design because we needed to make DMs and posters and uh, uh, our own kind of promotional material. I worked with a, with a partner at that time. Uh, we were called Hargrave and Roberts. Uh, we traveled around the state of Washington doing everything from table side, close up magic to stage performances for corporate events. So a lot of a big variety fairs and things like that. And I was working um, at a Microsoft vendor doing UI, UX design. And what really got me interested in traveling was actually the death of my great uncle, who in his last days gave me uh, some advice to sort of chase my passion first rather than settle down and value things like traveling and having fun early in my life rather than waiting you know, to some later stage of my life once I make some money and um, sort of buy a house and get locked in and, you know, things like that. And um, I was kind of on a path to get a loan for a house in Seattle and, and settle down and do those kind of things. And when my uncle Walter passed away, he, he sort of imparted this wisdom on me and I kind of abandoned my plan and I really wanted to spend my younger life. I was 25 at the time. I, I left when I was 26. Uh, to really to really travel and, and kind of figure out what I was interested in. And that's what I decided to do. I had no idea where I would end up. I mean, I never planned on really ending up in Taiwan. Um, I've been here for going on 19 years, so it was a really great discovery, but I never planned on it. And in the same way, I never planned on going into a design-related field, marketing and design. That sort of happened because of my love of magic. So I would say was, you know, in part combination of 
being so interested in, in magic and, and that pushed me to get into design. And then this other thing, the death of my uncle who kind of gave me the, the idea to, to go play when I'm young. So that, that's what I wanted to really do. Well, that magic thing seems like such a non sequitur into the design industry. So it's pretty fascinating that you transitioned from sleight of hand into what you're doing now. And are you still performing magic for fun? Yeah, I'm still doing magic just for fun. Yeah, it's always been a love of mine since I've been around seven or eight years old when I had a Harry Blackstone magic kit. Uh, my mom used to date somebody that worked for the Magic Castle in Hollywood. So when I saw this guy, Michael, do these sponge ball tricks, a pretty classic trick, that, that's something that just blew my mind and I was like hooked. I just had to know how it was done. You're listening to The Pure Now Show, a creative podcast for creatives presented by Balance. Well, the Magic Castle was where I had my surprise 30th birthday. That's where they took me. And uh, cool. it was a incredible experience man magic is it's unbelievable that we can you know convince people uh, that these things are really happening and so that's really amazing that you've got that kind of skill level and i mean i've i've looked at a lot of things that you've done in your life and you're a very interesting character you've done quite a bit of things um, but it's interesting that you landed in the creative industry you know you've used the creative world to support your magic and then at some point, you left the magic behind and went full time into being a creative professional. And uh, let's yeah. talk about that, how you, you know, went from UI and now you're, you're doing your own thing and you've got many yeah. years in the business. You've, you're a very seasoned professional. Let's talk about that journey and, and how you've ended up where you are today professionally. Yeah. Um... As I mentioned, you know, I started building websites very early in the 90s, like 93, 94 with uh, Netscape Navigator Gold was sort of like my first experience getting into doing web design. And really it was just a, a means to an end. Like magic was my love, my, my main passion, and we needed a website for the business. And that's the, the Kickstarter. And I could even I, I could even say although I've never really studied design in a in an academic sense, I was always interested in things very visual because even when I can think back how I really got started in design, you know, even when you take, you know, an English writing class and you've got to make a document that's like X pages long, I never wanted to write too much. I never wanted to do too much work. So how could I lay out the page in a way that would make the page look pretty full, but could extend, you know, I, I, don't ha I didn't have to write so much to make more pages. So these were like early things that kind of got me into kerning and, and, and line height and, and learning about the, the margins and the spacing and learning about typography. And it was really kind of self-taught. There was not too much back at that time, but that was the start. And that really pushed me into you know, when I finished college in 99, I went to work for internet startups in Seattle doing design-related work, uh, web-related, web production. Uh, eventually landed uh, a job as a UI designer for a Microsoft vendor and worked on a lot of different kinds of tools and applications. And I left that job to travel and eventually landed in Taiwan. I began working as a 1080 freelancer contractor for the, the company that I had left. Uh, I did that as a remote uh, working job in, in 2003. It was a little different doing remote work at that time. The, you know, the internet was not quite as fast. You know, we had calling cards. We, there were no smartphones. Things were a little different, you know, no Slack. And eventually through Doing that, I, I uh, eventually started doing other freelance projects, some in Taiwan and some out of Taiwan. Then I started working, doing UI and product design at a, at a startup in Taiwan for a company called Getchi. And I was there for quite some time, I think a, a bit over six years. And eventually had a really great opportunity to move to Acer as the global creative director. 
I ran a team of uh, around 40 people there. Uh, it was more or less an internal agency. We did everything from product photography and 3D video to advertising. We managed the, the global uh, website, uh, all of the copywriting. So it was a lot, a big, a big scope of work, and I learned a lot. It was a lot of pressure on me at first. I was a little bit nervous when I first started the, the role. It was a, lot, a big responsibility for me. And then around four years ago, I decided to leave and start Level Interactive, and that's been another really great turnaround, a, a new corner and uh, a, a new journey, basically. How's your Chinese? Kai, well, kai, yeah. Yeah, it's okay. My wife is Taiwanese, uh, so I have a daily lesson, and she's always helping me improve. Being able to speak Chinese, you know, it opens the door to a lot of new opportunities, and and um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty important thing. Although, you know, a lot of people can speak English pretty well in in Taipei, but when you get to the outskirts, it's definitely important. Well, you mentioned Sun Che, right?、Uh, my closest expat friend here. He's been in Asia for 30 years, and the only thing he took in college was Chinese. So he came here 30 years ago to Taiwan, married a Taiwanese woman, obviously could navigate the area easily, and he said some of his best times were in Taiwan. He really loved it, and he's a computer geek. He's a software guy and、uh, an electronics guy. So Sun Che, like you said, is the Silicon Valley of of Taiwan, he absolutely adored being there, and his 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 wife is his ex wife is still there. So,、um, but he has nothing but incredibly positive things to say about his experience there. Yeah, Taiwan is a really really great place. I never expected to stay here so long. I thought you know originally maybe I'll stay for a year. A year quickly became three years, and you know, over that time when I would travel back home. I would do some things just kind of subconsciously. Was reducing my material things back in Seattle. I got rid of my storage. I sold my car. I, I just reduced the things I had. And whenever I flew back to Taiwan, I had this like feeling when I landed on the tarmac, like this feeling of like, you know, like oh yeah, it feels good to be back here, even at the airport. And then it kind of dawned on me after a few years, if I feel that way when I'm just in the airport. It must mean something. So why do I have to leave? I don't have to leave. I, I always held this idea, this notion above my head that it's temporary. You're going to need to leave. You shouldn't buy furniture. You shouldn't nest. The first few years, I lived like a college student or something. I just didn't really nest in my in my own home. Eventually, I bought a house here around 12 years ago, and then I nested and made a lot of homemade. Furniture and, and it's nice to to invest in the in the the quality of your living environment and not not feel so temporary. Taiwan is definitely my home. It's where I'm settled, so that has been really nice. Yeah, I feel the same way about Vietnam. You know, I've detached myself from the states, but I came here thinking that I will never leave. I mean, I'd never even been here before, and and there hasn't been a day gone by that I haven't. Been very grateful that I made this decision to come here, and I have no intention of returning other than a potential visit. But actually, I want to bring my kids here so they can see why their dad is so happy, and what are the significant differences between the states and Asia, which are obviously innumerable. So you've got your own agency now. You know you've got your own clients. Let's talk about your experience because you obviously have local clients. What has that been like for you to work in a,、uh, a different culture, with people who think differently about business,、uh, about strategy, about branding? How have、yeah. you brought your sensibility, your creative sensibility, from the states to Taiwan, and and how has that translated into how you do business there? Yeah, we work with both local clients and international clients.、Uh, It, the split is actually about 70/30 right now, 30% in Taiwan. So we're still mostly focused on. I wouldn't even necessarily say focus, but it just happens to be that a lot of our business is not in Taiwan.、Uh, we do have some really great clients in Taiwan, and and we're getting more and more leads all the time. Typically, the 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 sell of of like a You know, a rebranding or a, a branding case in Taiwan sometimes is difficult because the conversation we have with companies here—not all companies value the, or at least are seeing eye to eye on what really is 
branding. There's, there's kind of a misconception of what it is. You know, a lot of companies think that's something you do once and then you finish it and then you move on. Or, or that's just logo design. It's just a big misunderstanding, I think, uh, generally speaking, of what really is branding because it's a little bit difficult to measure. And, you know, you invest in doing some activities and then you may not see the, the exact return when it comes. It's, it's, it's not as exact as a promotion where, you know, when you do marketing promotions, you know, buy one, get one free or Black Friday sale or something like that, it's pretty apparent what the return is. You know, you spend X dollars and you get X dollars back. Branding is a little bit different. So we have actually had to focus a little bit more in Taiwan on other benefits that come with branding. So things like cost savings. That's not always something that people think about. You know, when you put together a really great brand identity system and templates, you can actually save cost over time. You don't need to remake things as often. You know, you can keep your team more organized and more in line. There's a lot of benefits that come with it. Taiwan has never, or it, it hasn't really been a very strong market for doing marketing. It's always been a very strong market for doing manufacturing and logistics and supply chain management and things like that. But when it comes to telling a story or, or the, the sort of branding and marketing end of it, a lot of Taiwanese companies still don't really understand how to hold the conversation. They tend to be very, very feature focused. So really, you know, whatever the, the whatever the device is, it's really about all the things that it can do. It's it's really about how many terabytes, what's the the battery type. It's very much the 1000 terabytes versus 1000 songs in my pocket, the famous i, you know, iPod marketing line, which is like really really emotionally driven. Like it really resonates with people. It, it means something. You know, 1000 songs in your pocket versus 1 terabyte. What is a terabyte? It's hard to understand for some people. So we've had to reshape the conversation when we engage with clients here to talk about how important the emotional side of, uh, you know, the emotional message and how important that can be for telling your brand story. And we do focus also on other benefits that clients can get out of the branding process. It's not about only increasing your recognition over time, being able to charge a premium over time, but there's also a cost savings that can come with it too. You don't need to remake things so often. You have systems that when you outsource to freelancers or insource to your own designers, they have guidance that they can work from. It's not everyone make up your own information, which is ultimately going to cause a lot of problems for companies because they're going to have a lot of divergent, inconsistent marketing communications. There's a lot of benefits that can come from it. So that's that's kind of been our experience working with, with customers here. Oftentimes price point becomes an issue because it is a harder sell. When you do an event, there's maybe more of a, an immediate return or, or a promotion, there's an immediate return. Or you do paid advertising, there's an immediate you know return on ad, ad spend that, that you get more tangible. But the branding part is a little bit less. You're listening to The Pure Now Show, a creative podcast for creatives presented by Balance. Tangible. You're educating these people. They just don't have this awareness about them. And uh, you're, you're bringing something entirely new, a new way of thinking to really just a, a brick and mortar mentality about, you know, we make this and this is what it is and this is what you get and you're adding an entirely different emotional component to it. And I think that's all over Asia for the most part, even here in Vietnam. They're just not used to doing business this way. But it's great that you're actually bringing that to the table. You're opening up their minds to a lot of uh, opportunities to present themselves differently than they ever have before. Also too, you know, their customer base. You know, there's a lot of younger people coming up who are a little more savvy. Uh, as far as uh, consumers go here in Asia. So I'm sure it behooves them to have you guide them through this process to make them more accessible to a different demographic even through uh, creating new brand messaging, new ways of delivering products and services uh, in ways that they never you know, actually realized was possible before. Yeah, definitely. Actually, the younger generation 
I feel gets it more. You know, Taiwan has actually a negative population growth. It's a strange pocket of the, the world, you know. It's a, what you tend to find in Taiwan is that the average age of employees is quite older. And you'll find that in these companies, you'll find people that have been there for 20, 30, 40 years. You know, they've been there a long, long time. It's the first job that a lot of these employees ever had when they left university and you know we see it all the time we're working with a client right now who uh, is a is a manufacturer they are going through a rebranding they've been around for 40 plus years like a lot of companies in taiwan and they are refreshing their brand image because manufacturing has gone to china vietnam and, and southeast asia and the same story is true we had a workshop last week we interviewed a lot of the staff and we found that there were such a high percentage of employees that have been there for 20 plus years. And Acer was exactly the same situation. Hmm. And when you have a lot of younger university students, they're learning different things, you know, and they have different sorts of passion. And they are the ones that are much, much more likely to adopt new ideas and technology and tools. We use Slack for communication. We use Notion for all of our project management, and we use Google Drive for storage and a little bit of productivity. And it turns out that younger generations have no problem with this. They're totally like, yeah, Slack, cool, that this is, this works, this is good. But the older generations tend to use email and line groups and Microsoft Office. And, and not to say Office is old school, but the working style is a little bit old school where they don't necessarily use cloud documents. They're sending files back and forth in email. It's actually not the most efficient way to work. And I think we've been so spoiled with the introduction of tools like Google productivity tools where everyone can collaborate at the same time or Notion or Slack and these sorts of really, really collaborative tools that make a dispersed team run much more efficiently. If we had to deal with some of the ways that these older companies work internally, we really wouldn't survive very well. You know, sending files, physical files, storing files on our own computer, these sorts of older ways of working is not very efficient and kind of dangerous, actually. Give me an idea of, of something that didn't go really well. Yeah, we've got a consulting gig. Um, it's a retainer-based gig with uh, also another manufacturer here. And it is hard when People tend to do the way they're used to, and they don't necessarily think about what impact it might have on the greater team. So for example, purely using email to run projects, how crazy inefficient it can become. You know, we've tried to get the client on Slack, but the, the kind of feeling is like, oh, we're not used to it. We always used email before. Can we use line or email? And we're trying to strike a balance, right? Because, you know, we want to be efficient. We are also time-based too, you know? If I've got to spend extra time in emails or sifting through multiple versions of PowerPoint documents or Word documents, it's, it's ultimately going to cost the client more money. And I don't think that clients should be paying more money for things like not valuable administration. We have one project that I would say is like not it just doesn't run as efficiently because a lot of things are done with file-based management and you know it's more about sending files back and forth and editing things and we're really trying hard to get them to like steer it in the right way so we can be a little bit more efficient it's super apparent how damaging it is too because we found out about three weeks ago we were working from the wrong file and we didn't have the latest file so a lot of information that we were using to create new designs and new 3D renderings from is actually not the latest document. We're not all looking at a single source of truth, and that's the problem. We're not all looking at one single, you know, you know, Mark and Josh are looking at one document that has the latest information. You've got a version that's newer than what we have, and things get lost over email. It just happens, you know, and people don't always have the best email 
behavior, meaning that you've got crazy long threads. They don't always have the best subject lines. You have other topics that pop up within threads that didn't necessarily have that topic to begin with. And it becomes very challenging. It's really, really hard to manage projects like this through email. Email was never meant to be a project management tool. We only use email as a, as a first step for communication. We get off of email ASAP. So let's do an opposite now. I mean, that sounds really yeah. challenging, but your hands are tied a little bit because if, if people are not willing to make significant changes, even if it's in their best interest, you've just got to kind of work with them and I guess hope for the best. Let's talk about a project that's the opposite, uh, something super successful that went really well, maybe one of your favorite experiences producing creative. We did a rebrand for a company uh, in Taiwan called SCMT and they had been around for 20 plus years. Uh, they started as a cable extension company because in the 90s and before, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, we used to use coaxial cable to, to run CCTV camera facilities and, you know, in parking garages and buildings, etc. And it turns out that running coaxial cable is more expensive, it's less flexible, the, the, the wire is quite thick. So if you want to run that through concrete and you know build it into the building infrastructure, it actually costs quite a bit of money to do things like that. And there's a lot of downside. So this company created a way to use Cat5 Ethernet to run the line, which is a lot cheaper. And they have some components on the ends that convert it back into an audio video signal. So they had a new CEO, the son of the company, uh, came in, which is quite common in Asia, and he took over the company and decided to rebrand. And we ran the whole project using Slack for communication. We used Notion to run the project, and it went really, really well. Like the flow of the project went really well. Everyone that was involved really embraced the tools, and there were no real issues. And this is a company that primarily also used email to do most of the communication. They didn't really have any internal tools for doing project management. We later built their website, sct.com.tw, using the same exact uh, setup. And we've really spent a lot of time to template out our process using these tools based off of each project that we go through. We built sort of like a recipe, you know, step one, preheat the oven, step two, assemble the ingredients, step three, you know, we've really like stepped out each process and we have built it in a way where we can basically click a button and it auto generates a project based off of the project type. And then we simply assign staff, assign due dates, and that gets us a lot of the way really quickly. And so this has enabled us, a, a small team, to run pretty efficiently. If we didn't have these, I think we would be doing too much manual work. And there's too much reinventing that would have to happen. So uh, I'm really all about automation. <laughs> I want to spend my time outside of the office, to be honest. I would rather be backpacking and camping and surfing and doing fun things you know i love doing work but i don't want to be spending my entire life working all the time it's the exact advice my uncle recommended against so i really took that to heart you know when it's time to shop and finish work we want to work hard during the day we finish and and we've got some balance in our lives um, it helps me come back refreshed the next day as well. So I want to find ways to automate whatever we do. And that automation should help make things clearer for clients, make things easier and faster for us internally. And the, the, the tools we chose, I think, have been really helpful in doing that. Notion I mentioned several times already. I don't know if you've heard of it before. It's a really fantastic tool. And Slack, of course, probably you've heard of. Yeah, I have not heard of Notion, but I'm, I'm interested in finding out more. Um, yeah, great. At, at, at Balance, we have some really great tools. We use Frame and Monday.com and a few different yeah. ways to, to manage the process. And uh, most of our clients are international clients, so they're, they're already savvy with what's going on. We haven't had to do a lot of uh, retraining. And, uh, so, and you're right, it's, it's about simplifying the execution, making it relatively error-proof so work can get done and success can be had. You know, the pandemic has changed lots of things for people and it's been an imperative 
to really become more effective in communication, in delivery, organization, because people are dispersed. So how has that affected how you go about doing business and working with your teams and ensuring that your clients are still getting the high level of product that they expect and, and get that time that you want, that you need to live your life, your personal life, uh, outside of getting the work done. Yeah, from day one, we were always a cloud-based team. So we had always implemented these sorts of tools. Although the tools varied over time, when we first started, we were more heavily reliant on Google Drive and the Google productivity tools. We didn't introduce Slack and Notion until about a year after uh, we started. And then those tools really kind of propelled us, you know, made us better communicators and, and it just made us more efficient. So we were kind of always in a non-physical environment. We are always in a work from home sort of situation. So I think that's what we've always known. COVID did really affect us. The marketing spend dropped off quite a bit. We definitely had some leads that dried up during that time. And we lost a couple of retainers during that time. I think just generally speaking, people became more conservative with their marketing spend. And usually the money that we receive almost always comes from a, a marketing budget. And marketing seems to be the, the first and easy thing to hack when it comes to cutting budgets. At least it was also that case when I worked for Acer. A little over two years ago, we started another, we started a brand, a skincare brand in Taiwan. And we mostly did that because we thought it would be a really great passion project for our team. Um, it's a, I don't have the project around here somewhere. But uh, no, it's not on the table. But anyway, it's called Gabby Skin, and we did end up going into like the Mitsukoshi department stores here, and we have a, uh, a really great bookstore here called Asleep. We put in a proper store there, and we tried running stuff, and then all the COVID restrictions hit, and you know, Taiwan was doing such an amazing job at first, and then we started having more local infections, and we started to go into lockdown, and that was stressful. That was really stressful, you know, and heartbreaking too, because we put together a really beautiful booth and there was just no traffic to the department stores. I mean, it was like crickets, you know, and um, I think at the end of the day, we just barely covered our cost. We might have lost a little bit of money on it, but it was it was definitely a stressful situation. So we we really learned the power of direct to consumer. Everything we're doing for Gabby Skin is pretty much. You're listening to The Pure Now Show, a creative podcast for creatives presented by Balance. Online now. We found some really interesting ways. Actually, um, my wife came up with some really, really great ideas for how to market the skincare brand to Taiwanese consumers. We're mostly selling in Taiwan. We have a distributor also in Hong Kong. And, you know, we get some sales outside of those locations, but we're mostly focused in Taiwan. So Mandy, my wife, had an idea that based off of our retail experience, actually, we noticed that of the six SKUs that we produce, one SKU, which was the latest SKU we introduced, was outselling all of the other SKUs. And we think it's because that was the only one that had a physical sample, had a three milliliter sample. So we produced samples for some of the other SKUs, and we have now been running a campaign for two and a half months, maybe three months, where people can register for free samples online. And we mail them to their house and they go into a sort of automated system where we follow up. Hey, Mark, we were sending out the samples to you. You should receive them in a couple days. And then it waits 10 days. Hey, Mark, you probably received the samples. Uh, uh, we're wondering what you think. And we've got a sort of like follow up SOP. But based off of this campaign, we have a 14% conversion rate. There's about a four and a half times return on our ad spend and the average order is around 1500 NT on our website. So it's quite successful, like it, it works really well and what we learned didn't come like so naturally, it came because of our retail experience that we just realized people need to try skincare products and samples play a big role. You know, we've been trying this campaign for a few months and it's really interesting how it works. It's cool that you figured it out because it is a personal yeah. thing. People are literally applying it to their body 
And, uh, right. you know, we're all about chemicals. Some things don't jive with us. And I, even my girlfriend, you know, she puts very few things on her skin because she has reactions to things. She's very sensitive. And, uh, yeah. so that was, that was a natural intelligent thing to do to give people an opportunity to see if it works. And then of course they're going to buy if they like, you know, it's the try before you buy thing. Yeah. Exactly. And that's, ex you, you just named the, the, the ad that we're running, try before you buy. And people are usually very receptive to that because it's the convincer. I mean, nothing convinces a customer more than having the product and liking it ahead of time and then feeling comfortable laying down that money several times over through their lives. So what's going on now? I know there's some other activities happening in Taiwan. There's some uncertainty between maybe China and Taiwan right now. Is any of this affecting what you have going on? Can you, can you see, is it palpable? What is building? And how are you preparing to potentially have to deal with anything like that? I would say from a day-to-day -day perspective, it doesn't really affect our business or at least a noticeable area of our business. It is something that is concerning, but I'm not so paranoid about it that I'm actually considering you know, relocating or something like that. I mean, right. Taiwan is my home. I love it here. You know, it's really cool that your uncle left you parting words that really changed your life. It's incredible what the right seed planted at the right time can do. And, and, and because of that, I'm interested from your perspective, if you were going to give advice to young people, people who are coming into their own, they're, they're starting their professional path, if I could go back in time and give myself one piece of professional advice to like my younger self, if I was working in companies, which I always was until four years ago, the advice I would give myself is to skip jobs more often. So stay somewhere for a year, a year and a half, two years and jump. Stay at the next location for a couple years and change. Don't stay at one location for too long. The reason why is because You'll be able to learn a lot more, most likely. You'll be able to jump your salary exponentially because moving up in the ranks within one organization is gonna be a lot more difficult to get title promotions and salary promotions than it is when you hop to another job. I think that a lot of people are worried about doing that because somehow it makes them not loyal or it means that they didn't take anything seriously or something like that but i wouldn't worry too much about that you know i think staying within a job for one to three years or a year and a half to three years is completely reasonable and make more aggressive hops go for the jobs also that you're not going to be 100 percent confident and comfortable doing because it's the uncomfortableness it's the stuff that you're worried about that's really going to push you and make you learn when i took on the, the Acer job, I would say I was not the most prepared. I was not maybe the most perfect candidate, but I, I think I had the right thinking to attack the problems that came to me and the right team because we had a good team there, you know, and, and we can delegate. So I think skipping jobs is really good and that will help you learn more. It will help you get better salary promotions and better title promotions. And those will just snowball. Once you have the titles, they will lead into other titles. You get to your manager, senior manager, director, all of a sudden you're at a VP level. And then the ceiling is sort of opened up and you, you have a little bit more flexibility. So I would say in a set career within a, within a, a like a salaried position, hop around. And meanwhile, chase a little bit of your passions while you have a real job. While you have a stable income, chase your side hustle and be serious about it. It doesn't necessarily take a ton of time, but it takes a regimented schedule. Like every Sunday from 10 to one o'clock, I'm just gonna focus on my side passion project. It's just at one time during the week that I've got a few hours where I'm gonna plan and work on something. And other than that, if you're a designer, to be honest, when we hire for level the most important thing we look at is a portfolio it's not your cv it's not where you went to school it's not anything else i'm looking for a kick-ass portfolio that's what we're looking for and if you have to augment your portfolio with projects that are not real projects that you just put conceptual ideas like you want to remake 
Boeing's website or you want to remake a high profile website and put it in your portfolio, say that it's like a passion project or that it's a concept or something like that, but that can showcase your work in a really great way, maybe more meaningful than like the holiday gift cards you were actually hired to make. I used to have a, a, an agency and represented about 300 creative professionals in Southern California. And, and our artist said, we want to make movie posters. I said, well, then you need to create movie posters that look real. And it doesn't matter that they're not. It's, it's the perception of the value of the creative that is in your book that informs somebody that you can do the work. You can make up all kinds of comps of anything. You can use existing brands. You can make ads for McDonald's. You can do whatever you want. As long as it looks good, nobody cares if it was actually really reproduced or not. That's secondary. It's 100% true. And people don't, people, whether they say it or not, I really think people are very visual creatures. When you start looking through a portfolio, you just look at the visuals, right? And then secondarily, you look at how are you involved in this project? But leading with really beautiful work is the way to go, I think. Yeah, it's all about presentation. Yeah. And those, those artists that I repped that took my advice, their money went from $25 an hour up to $75 to $100 an hour just because they repositioned themselves by creating work that people wanted to see and wanted to have reproduced for themselves. So it's, it's a pretty solid strategy that you, know, you can't lose. Definitely. My final question is, if you could not do what you're doing now, that yeah. was all taken from you, but you had to find something else fun to do that satisfied you, what might that be? Interior design. I, ah. I didn't realize this until very late. You know, the design, regardless of the of the industry, you know, there's so many facets of design. There's you know, branding design or, or, or graphic layout design, typographic design, interior design or architecture. There's, there's so many. I didn't realize until very late in my life that I really love interior design. And if I could go back in time, that's probably what I would do. I'm a real big fan of a YouTube channel called Never Too Small. You know, I follow it and I, I mean, I subscribe to it and all of the new episodes, I really love how they go through the design thinking and, and they talk about who the client is and what they care about and how they want to live. And they use that information to apply it to the space. It's very similar to what we do as well in our design field. It's just a different field. So yeah, I, I just found a passion for designing furniture, which I, most of the furniture in my house is designed by me and made by a carpenter. I don't, I'm not actually able to put it together, but at least uh, sketched out by me and um, interior design. Yeah, that's, that's what it would be. Fun. Josh, it's been really fantastic to talk to you. Really appreciate that you spent some time to be on the Pure Now show. And uh, I know you have a lot more stories to tell, but I, I appreciate that you consolidated as much as you did into our hour. It was super fun. No problem. Thanks. If you enjoyed the Pure Now show, you can check out more episodes at balancestudio.tv or anywhere fine podcasts are broadcast. Pure Now is produced and engineered by Hai Ha Dang and directed by Dong Wun Guan. Special thanks to our media sponsor, Maybe and iDesign.vn. Thanks so much for watching.